I'm David Welbury. Um, I'm in the Department of Germanic Studies and the Committee on Social Thought and the College, of course. And I'm pleased to be here once again for Humanities Day. I've been doing it, I think, almost every year for the past five or six years, one topic or another. This year, I originally gave as my topic uh, the aphorism, a German form, uh, because the aphorism is a form that has been particularly cultivated in the German literary tradition. And that, of course, is how I became interested in it. Um, writers in whom I have a research interest, writers such as Goethe and Nietzsche, practice the aphorism. And that seemed to me like a, a good title. But then I realized that that's actually completely unfair. Uh, the aphorism is, is actually not a German invention. And it is cultivated in other uh, traditions as well. And I'll be talking about uh, especially a couple of French writers uh, today, in addition, to, um, in addition to the German writers that I mentioned and a couple of others. There'll be a slight prejudice in favor of the German writers, but uh, not, uh, not too much. My project, then, is not a national one, but it is a project in poetics. Poetics is the study of literary forms. The study of literary forms as a systematic study began with Aristotle. Aristotle set the paradigm for the study of literary forms, and it's within that paradigm that I stand before you today. The task of poetics is, or one of the principal tasks of poetics is, to discriminate the literary kinds, or what we refer to as genres, the types or kinds of literature. The project is not simply to classify them, list them, and put them into groups, but to show some kind of systematic relationship among those literary kinds. Most famously, of course, is the systematic relationship between tragedy and comedy. Tragedy and comedy, two parallel but distinct and opposed literary kinds, have made their way through literary history and are undoubtedly deeply rooted in our, I shall say, anthropological constitution. Laughter and crying, it is sometimes said, are distinguishing features of the human being. And tragedy and comedy, or I should say, comedy and tragedy, laughter and crying, um, uh, seem to have something to do with those two fundamental human experiences. Today I want to talk about the genre of the aphorism. I'll try to say something systematic about it. And I will um, um, uh, endeavor to show its relationship to some other literary uh, kinds or strategies uh, that you are familiar with. Let's start off with the lexicographical matter, a basic definition. The term aphorism is old. It goes back to ancient Greece, aphorismos. And what I would particularly stress here is that if a word familiar to us, the word horos, which is embedded in our word horizon, is contained in that idea of aphorism. And aphorism, we can say, is a drawing of a horizon around, a delimitation and definition. Indeed, that's what a definition is. A definition is the circumscription of an area within which certain things fall and outside of which other things fall. A chair circumscribes all those things that people sit on. And those things that people eat at are not chairs, but fall outside. So the aphorism is related to the idea of definition, related to the idea of carving out a conceptual limit, of getting something clear and bringing it into sharp profile. Uh, the Greek word meant, then, delimitation or definition. It also meant medical proposition. And indeed, the first collection of aphorisms, as they were called and have been called in the tradition, is the collection of Hippocrates, his medical propositions. And one of Hippocrates' most famous aphorisms that has been delivered down to us is that life is short and art is long. This is a particularly interesting case, by the way, uh, for two reasons. For one, because the Latin, which some of you may know, 
Vita Brevis Ars Longa has a bit more punch than the English translation. And that brings us to the problem of translation of aphorism. The aphorism is a linguistically dense form and therefore not easy to translate. There will be some examples of that with my translations as we move further along. But Hippocrates, Hippocrates aphorism, life is short, art is long, uh, has actually been massively misunderstood through the tradition. And so it's an example of an aphorism that has changed its meaning and has come to mean something quite different than what it originally meant. What it originally meant was that the things that the physician deals with move very fast, but the physician's techniques are slow and long, and so it's difficult for the doctor to actually bring his methods to bear on a particular case. What that aphorism has come to mean is that though our lives are short, our artworks stand forever, and that, so life is brief and art is long. Another important, very, very important source for the aphorism, especially as it developed in Germany, is the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus. Uh, Heraclitus is famous for a number of, of aphorisms that, unfortunately, not in his works, which are all lost, but in citation in various points in antiquity have been uh, delivered to us. And indeed, as we will see, the aphorism has become something like a genre located at the intersection of philosophy and literary or poetic expression. Uh, concision, uh, the term can also simply uh, refer to a kind of style, and concision in style is indeed the characteristic feature of the aphorism. It is the case that in addition to the word aphorism, there are a number of other words out there that designate short forms that have a relationship, a kindred relationship to the aphorism. I'm going to try to draw a distinction among these forms, and we have them here. I've distinguished uh, the aphorism from the apothegm, the sententia. That's a word, a Latin word that we tend to know in the plural sententiae, collection of sententia, collection of sententiae. Uh, we know that in English, basically in, in, terms, in, in the adjective sententious, when someone's being sententious, it has a particular meaning. I'll come back to that. Distinguishing it from the maxim and the adage as well. I want to stress that this distinction is a false and artificial distinction that I'm making. It's the, it, it, because the term maxim, especially, is a term that blends into the aphoristic tradition and some of the most important writers of what we refer to as aphorism so indeed referred to their own works as maxims. But I would say that the apothegm is, a, is, a, is known for its complete compression, cleanliness is next to godliness. A sententiae is a kind of authoritative and unassailable pronunciation of a truth of some kind. Not accidentally did that term have its uh, origin in collections of such sententiae from the church fathers. That's where that association of authority and unassailability comes. But if we get a writer who tends a bit toward the apodictic, very often we will say that that writer has a sententious style. The great German poet Schiller in his theoretical writings is one such person who is always coming up with end of the paragraph one-liners like this. Uh, Life is serious, art serene. Life is, life is hard work. You're bumping up against reality, but art takes you into a kind of serene sphere of consciousness. That was the point he was driving at. A maxim, I believe, is a term is generally used today, not, for instance, in the 17th century, about which I'll be talking about in a minute. A maxim is generally thought of as a maxim of action. Right? I act according to certain maxims. It is a maxim of mine, for instance, that I don't always live up to. Don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. That's a good rule for life and maxims. That's, there are a bunch of those that we all carry around uh, with us. And then there are ad adages. Um, and uh, 
for the need is a friend indeed. I'm sorry, there's a period missing here. I've got two examples here. A friend in need is a friend indeed. You've got that little jingle-like quality to it. I'm sure that you heard this one from your parents and they heard it from their parents. A stitch in time saves nine. That uh, goes back to an earlier uh, uh, stage where everybody, everybody knew about stitching uh, in their lives and so that uh, is something that fits. Note this, note that there's a, there is a, 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 a porous boundary among these types, a porous boundary. A stitch in time saves nine, we might say, is an adage form of the maxim, don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. The thought is roughly the same thought that we're capturing there. Now, if we look at all of these forms here, what I want to say about these forms is that they are characterized by the following. They are, first of all, in almost every case, anonymous. They belong to the folk poetry of our moral lives. We don't know where they came from. We've heard them all over the place. They're like, they're like folk tunes that, that we don't know who the author is. They tend to be oral. Of course, someplace they're written down and collected, but they tend to be oral, uh, and they are known orally. That is to say, they're known in oral memory. You don't sit down and read a list of things, cleanliness is next to godliness, etc., unless you happen to be studying those, that particular form of folk expression, as you will. And therefore, the formal features that these tend to show the formal features that they show are formal features that are mobilized with the intention of easy recall. All of these play into what we might call oral memory. Right? So we have a certain set of, of compact and catchy phrases, sentences, formulations that guide us through our practical and moral lives. And these, these are are different, as it were, different, different accentuations, different declinations uh, of that basic practice. In contradistinction to these forms, the aphorism is designed not for ready recognition, but rather it is an exploratory genre. The purpose of the aphorism is to provoke thought not to give you instant recognition, but to provoke thought. And thus, whereas cleanliness is next to godliness, is as transparent it can be, as could be, and rings in your ear, the aphorism is typically going to have a certain non-transparent quality to it. There's going to be a level of deliberate difficulty here. It is a written genre. It is a genre that is written, and it is located, as I indicated before, at the frontier of philosophical moral reflection on the one hand, and literature on the other. Aphorisms are not necessarily terribly brief, although all of the examples, for obvious reasons that I will bring today, are, um, are um, very brief. But the, 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 the limits of the aphorism are not clear. Uh, Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher of the first half of the 19th century, wrote a collection of aphorisms on the wisdom of life. Aphorisms on the wisdom of life is what he called it. And these, th these aphorisms tend to run to about three or four pages. So there's a way in which the aphorism can expand out in the direction of what? In the direction of the essay. An essayist and an aphorist are often two versions of the same writer. They are kindred talents, kindred genre, and sometimes very difficult to distinguish one from another. Crucial is that it is a written form. It is designed to be read, and not read and consumed like that, but read and reread, thought over. All right. One of the phrases or terms, it's not a phrase, it's a term that has emerged in German uh, that emphasizes the points that I've, uh, that I've made here, um, or especially the point about the written quality, is that the term aphorism has been replaced by a number of writers who produce aphorisms by the term Aufzeichnung. And an Aufzeichnung simply means something that has been written down. So what you get are, we might say, notations. Right? 
You can imagine these writers going through the world with their moleskin books and writing down their Aufzeichnungen, right? And of course, the aphorism is individually authored. It is not anonymous. It doesn't belong to our, our um, folk patois. It rather is individually authored. And indeed, a certain individual style can be achieved in the aphorism. Now, what I want to use as a conceptualization, as you could tell by the, the um, uh, title of my talk, a conceptualization of the form of the aphorism is the combination of these two terms, the term condensation on the one hand and surprise on the other. These, it seems to me, are the two fundamental characteristics of the aphorism. By condensation, what I mean, condensation is a word that in, in German was used, uh, Verdichtung, a kind of compacting, was used by Freud, for instance, to talk about a, a, a uh, technique of the dream work, as he called it. And it's a way of bringing multiple thoughts together into a single representation. We might think of it as compression. We might think of it as a kind of, 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 of parallelism of lines of thought that are brought into a single, um, a single expression. And surprise, I needn't tell you what that <laughs> word means, but surprise, I want to say, and for good reason, is an essential characteristic of this form, uh, the aphorism. What we're dealing with with the aphorism is a form of thought, then, in which what I want to call rarefaction, rarefaction, in other words, the drawing out, out of that ocean of thought and that ocean of noise and language that we live in, a rarefaction is a drawing out of some sort of an essential structure. It's almost like, it's almost like the process of producing a perfume to get the essence, to get to the essence, right? You get a perfume that, that has the essence of apple blossoms in April in Vermont, right? <laughs> That's what the aphorism is. It's the essence of a certain thought. And that rarefaction goes together with isolation. The aphorism, in contradistinction, of course, to flowing longer literary forms, is surrounded by white. It stands almost like a poem, free and in itself. This combination of the essence on the one hand, the condensed essence on the one hand, and isolation on the other, produces a very important cognitive effect, and that's the effect of concentration. It brings us into a state of mind of concentrating on this thought that is being presented to us. In contradistinction to any linear form, any linearly unfolding form, because there we're carried from thought to thought to thought. There we count on the writer in the next sentence to tell us what the last sentence mean and what the next implication is that we have to follow and so forth. Here we have that isolation, concentrated focus, and it is up to us to develop the the implications. For the brevity here is not simply brevity. It's not simply concision. It is concision with abundance, concision with richness of content. An aphorist who is concise but has nothing to say is not an aphorist. I should say that, uh, actually, I should formulate that differently. I should say concise but has nothing not to say because a lot of what is conveyed by the aphorism is not explicitly formulated. Right? We'll get back to this point in just a moment. So the peculiar richness of the aphoristic form is the richness of implications, the richness of interconnections. And now I come to a central point. As we will see in the um, examples that I'm going to look at for, uh, in just a moment, the, the way we receive, the way we read, receive is a sort of technical term in literary studies for reading or responding to, the way we respond to, the to an aphorism looks something like a three-stage movement. First of all, there is what you would call linguistic decoding. You just have to figure out what is being said. Second of all, 
There's what we might think of as exfoliation. You develop, and you develop, the implications of what is being said. And third of all, after you have developed those implications, you return to the formulation. And you say, didn't he do that well? Wasn't that terrific? Now I see what that's all about. Now I understand that. So we have this return to the formulation itself. And in that return, we see it again. And now we recognize what was really contained in that. This is a very, very common human experience on the one hand, but it is an absolutely essential poetic experience on the other. Aristotle called it anagnorisis, recognition. In the course of the play, you go along, certain things have been set up in the course of the plot, and then the plot reaches a certain point and you say, aha, now I've got it. You're looking back on everything and you see it as if anew. As I say, this happens to us in our daily lives as well, when you, know, you reach a point where, ah, now I see what that was all about. So anagnorisis as a formal virtue, as a formal virtue is something that we find uh, here. And it's not simply a recognition of the content and its meaning. As I said, it's a recognition of the, and an acknowledgement of, the artistic achievement of the aphorism that is involved here. The second thing that I want to stress in addition to that circular movement is the element of surprise. Surprise, I want to say, is the trigger of cognitive activity. This is generally true also. We don't think all the time. Well, we think all the time, but we think habitually all the time. We're, we're on the way doing that which we always do and knowing what we do, and it is so ingrained, so entrenched, that we don't have to concentrate on it, and we don't have to think anew. But boom, a surprising situation comes, something unexpected comes along, and that's when the mind begins working. And that is the case with the aphorism as well. The aphorist must, in some sense, create a sense of surprise. He must startle us. He must, I say he, that's not entirely fair, but uh, I, I'll just continue to use that. He must make us wonder. He must make us wonder. He must awaken in us that first philosophical virtue that Aristotle and others called wonderment. What is this? Why is this of it? Surprise, then, is the trigger that takes us out of our habitual cognitive activity and gets us to think first personally. The cause of surprise is often, as we will see, a reversal, a sudden turn of things, an unexpected turn of events. So not just something else happens, but just the opposite happens of what you would have expected. This can be pushed to the point of paradox and have a paradoxical effect, a superficial paradoxical effect, because eventually we will work out what the situation is here and what the embracing truth of the paradoxically paired terms are. Now, Aristotle, who is my master in this particular inquiry, said that peripatia, a turning around, and anagnorisis, a recognition, are two of the excellences that we find in dramatic um, literature, in particular in the tragedy. He didn't get to write the section on the comedy, but in particular in the tragedy. Those are two of the excellences that the drama has, and they are most excellent, he wrote, when they fall together, when the turning of events falls together with that aha effect of recognizing what it is about. In this sense, we can say that the aphorism is the drama of thought. The aphorism is giving us a compressed drama, not an extensive one unfolding in the realm of human action and interaction, but one unfolding, as it were, in our thinking, in our conceptualization, in our understanding of the world. I've concentrated on plot. There are also issues of character. There is, in other words, in the aphorism, look at, look at cleanliness is next to godliness here. 
There's no character behind this. Anybody could say that. But in the aphorism, there's a certain stance that is taken. There is a certain individuality that comes to expression. It's not a personal individuality, but it's what we might call an epistemological or observational individuality, a way of looking at the world that each of us can try on. And hopefully you'll begin to feel that with the aphorist that I'm going to uh, take a look at. And finally, in addition to identifying that subjective stance, we can also take a step further, a step that Aristotle himself typically did not take, and say, what is the historical unfolding of these different stances? Is there a history of the genre of the aphorism? And does that history reflect different subjectivities? I'm going to give examples here that I think embody three types of subjective stance. The first stance is the stance of the moralist. The second is the stance of the scientific human observer. And the third is the stance of the experimental thinker, the thinker who is testing the limits of his or her um, own experience. That said, and with a view to the clock, let's take a look at a couple of examples. The first person I want to call attention to here is the uh, famous La Rochefoucauld. La Rochefoucauld was a duke. He was a very important nobleman in 17th century France, but an unfortunate one in the sense that he fell victim to the centralization of the absolutist state that Louis XIV and his ministers were carrying out. That involved an evacuation of the power of the inherited nobility, leaving them, well, first of all, leaving them without much power, second of all, leaving them without much to do, and making them feel completely dependent on a centralized administrative apparatus where they no longer had a voice. This even led to a kind of rebellion that La Rochefoucauld participated in, the so-called Fronde, unsuccessful rebellion against the central administration on the part of the inherited nobility. That got him into trouble, sent him out into exile for a while. He then was able to return to Paris. And this is a person who spent time at court. It is of crucial importance to know that he spent time at court because the fundamental feature of La Rochefoucauld's work is the perspective of the moralist, and the moralist perspective is one that is developed at court. Now, we don't have courts today, but there may be something that's vaguely related to the court that, you, that will resonate with you. But the basic feature of courtly behavior is that there is a distinction between overt behavior on the other and actual subjective motivation on the one hand and, and actual subjective motivations on the other. The ob moralist observer is the observer who sees beneath the veneer of human self-presentation in order to discover the motives that lie behind that. And that is characteristic of the maxims of La Rochefoucauld through and through. If we, love, if we judge love by the majority of its results, it rather resembles hatred than friendship, a way of cutting through our ordinary talk about love and to see the kinds of antagonisms that can emerge there. There is real love, and this is, this is where wit comes into it. There is real love just as there are real ghosts. Every person speaks of it. Few have actually seen it. <laughs> La Rochefoucauld published in, I'd have to look it up, I think in the 60s, he published a volume of Maxims. It was then expanded in several things. It was one of the most famous documents of French classicism, and these are just a couple of, of uh, examples from it. You see that strategy here is to cut through values that we simply accept as, as being true and to show that they are superficial phenomena. Let's take a look at this very, very cynical, one might say, version. But if you're thinking of his situation at court, you might better understand it. What men term friendship is merely a partnership 
with a collection of reciprocal interest and an exchange of favors. In fact, it is but a trade in which self-love always expects to gain something. And indeed, it is this self-love, the hidden motivation behind our transactions, that which really underlies and motivates our action, even though we cover it with the veneer of politeness or friendship or loyalty or what have you, uh, that is actually the key notion of the moralist, the notion that humans are motivated principally by uh, self-love. Nonetheless, within that courtly sphere, there is a kind of honor, and La Rochefoucauld has a number of uh, views about that honor, and I've selected one out here. This, is, this comes very close to a kind of maxim. This tells you what it's right to do. And as I said, he titled his things Reflections and Maxims. This is a brief reflection. It is more disgraceful to distrust than to be deceived by our friends. The person who, as it were, knows this and therefore distrusts everyone, nonetheless brings disgrace on himself. There is a kind of honor in not distrusting, distrusting even though one might very well be uh, deceived in that. In the 18th century, the other great French uh, aphorist in the moralist tradition, Nicolas Chamfort, who had a very, very interesting life. He was the, he was the son of a noble woman and a village priest, that is to say, an illegitimate child. Upon birth, he was turned over to a grocery store owner, but money was given for his education by his mother, and so he was uh, uh, educated. And you can see, uh, actually, the date is wrong. I'm sorry. I see, I've, there's a typo. 1794 is the date. Um, so uh, Rochefoucauld went to uh, uh, um, become educated. He was supposed to become an abbé, he was an officer in the church, but instead he became a tutor and he went to Paris and became a writer and was a very successful dramatist and a speech writer. He gave famous éloge. And then one of his dramas was uh, captured the imagination of Marie Antoinette, and she became his patron and gave him a steady income. And he was quite a successful writer. And then as the revolution broke out, he sided with the Girondists. And that, as you can imagine, got him into trouble later. When Robespierre came into power, he had Chamfort arrested. He was released, but then he was about to be arrested again. And it was then that he committed suicide. And he left us a fine collection, much admired by later aphorists, fine collection of aphorisms. And let's take a, couple, a look at a couple of his. Uh, so you see that moralistic point of view here that looks through things. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it's tinged here with a, with a kind of tragic sense uh, that is perhaps befitting uh, the life of, uh, of Chamfort. Uh, the most reasonable and balanced position in the internal, eternal debate, celibacy or marriage, is either way you'll regret it. Um, this is one that I think is really an interesting one. And we're going to see a couple of variants of that as we go further. When have you actually wasted your day? According to Chamfort, that day which is sunk into oblivion because it wasn't worth it, it wasn't worth it, is the day on which you haven't laughed. To have laughed is the criterion, one might say the base criterion, of a successful day. Chamfort was a man who was living in extremely turbulent times, as was La Rochefoucauld, and could observe the influence of passion on human beings and discovered that there's a certain paradox in passion. The passion makes the intelligent dumb, but it can make the dumb intelligent. Passion can take the somewhat uh, unskilled individual, the greatest dope in the world, and because he's so passionate, really drive him to do the right thing at the right moment. The paradox of passion is that it has those different results, depending on who. For the intelligent man who is seized by passion can characteristically make, characteristically make some pretty bad decisions. The next person that I want to introduce you to, and now we're getting into the German tradition, is perhaps, um, perhaps 
the most famous, perhaps the most beloved aphorist in the German tradition. Some of you may have heard of Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. Here we see a statue of him. As you can see, he was a small man. Uh, and this statue is in the town square in the city of Göttingen, located in Nieder, uh, Saxon, uh, um, Lower Saxony in uh, Germany, where there's a very famous university. The University of Göttingen was the university in Germany of the Enlightenment, the most important Enlightenment university. And Lichtenberg was a professor of physics at that university. And he was much, uh, much beloved. But we see him here carrying this ball. It's a ball that you see has got the plus and the minus on it. That's because our terms of positive and negative electric um, charges come from him. He's the one who did that. He was, a, he was an experimental scientist. His lectures were centered on experiments. But he was also, he was also a somewhat uh, idiosyncratic character. And he was an Anglophile a passionate Anglophile. He had spent time in England. And we owe Lichtenberg uh, a brilliant, brilliant commentary on the um, elaborate Prince of Hogarth, for instance. And Lichtenberg kept something uh, that he called his Zudelbücher, his, uh, it's hard to say what they are, his dirt books, his, his waste books, I believe is the term that we use in English for those, in which he noted his thoughts. And those thoughts that he noted, many of them are considered to be really one of the major contributions to the aphoristic style, um, or, or to the tradition of aphorisms. Lichtenberg inaugurates, in my view, what I would call the scientific mode of the aphorism. Now, by the scientific mode of the aphorism, of course, I don't mean that he's conducting scientific <coughs> inquiry that way. What I mean is that the perspective that he brings to things is no longer that un, undeluded perspective of the moralist who sees through. It's no longer that jaded, if you will, or cynical or penetratingly critical view or skeptical view. Well, he's skeptical. Let's leave skeptical in there because he's, he's always testing things. But it's the view of the scientist that he was. It's taking a look at human behavior from the outside. And it's trying to see whether our traditional accounts of that behavior really hold up. And quite often, it turns out that they don't. Here are a couple of examples from, um, <laughs> from Lichtenberg that, um, that I think are uh, they're all interesting. Uh, but I uh, want to concentrate on the first two for a moment. The American, and of course he means the Native American, the Native American who first discovered Columbus made a terrible discovery. How true that sentence is. But you can see what we get here is a reversal of perspective, a reversal of a perspective that gives us a whole new look at that event. How many times have we heard that Columbus discovered North America, or this world, or what have you, discovered the New World? How seldom have we thought about it as a discovery from the other perspective and reversed our thinking of the entire event in terms of that other perspective. This one is something that uh, is also uh, uh, in beloved particularly by university professors who assign, assign a reading and find that it didn't go over well with the, with the students. <laughs> when a book and a head collide, and there's a hollow sound, is it always the fault of the book? Really, what is the, and now you begin to exfoliate the, the ramifications here, right? Is the situation of judgment, when we're dealing with cultural achievements, is the situation of judgment just a one-way street? Is it only the consumer who judges the work, the reader who judges the book? Or isn't there a way in which the book creates a situation in which we are being judged as to whether we are worthy of it? 
That's the re-perspectivization that we get here in both of these first two, if you think about it. Lichtenberg turning the perspective around, and once you turn the perspective around, you see things in a different way, and it can illuminate, I want to put it this way, it can illuminate your moral universe. Here we have, here we have the scientist observing himself. I read and I eat. What is the similarity between reading and eating? In both cases, we're taking something in. In both cases, we tend to forget what we have taken in. But in both cases, they are nurturing us in some way. And finally, I'm going to skip this one here, although I think it's quite an interesting one, um, and point to this one here. How interesting this is from the point of view of the experimental scientist. The human's tendency to regard little things as important has produced very many great things. This really makes sense when you think of it in terms of the scientific perspective. When you think of the person who says, isn't there a better material for that little wire or something like that in a way that can transform human life? That's the view of the scientist. Our curiosity is insatiable, and even as it descends into the most minute of things, it nonetheless uh, can reveal things that are of immense importance for us. There is a very nice collection, I think, uh, published by Penguin of, of Lichtenberg's waste books that I can recommend uh, to you. The next person that I want to refer to, of course, is my person, uh, <laughs> Goethe. And I'm not going to say anything about Goethe. He was, of course, the great poet and scientist. And that's why his, his aphorisms fall within this category of a scientific view of things, but not really fully in the sense of the, the, the external observer that we find in, in um, Lichtenberg, but uh, with, a, with a more of a poetic sense. Now here, I've, uh, I did that also later with, with Nietzsche, but we're not going to have time to look at the German at all. But just take the first one. The tiniest hair casts a shadow. Well, one could say that is a banal truth. But noticed and isolated, remember what I said about isolation and rarefaction, noticed and isolated what happens. What happens is that we begin to think that through. And then we realize that, as it were, everything has its weight in being. Everything has its significance. And then we begin to think that even something as small and trivial as this sentence, the tiniest hair casts a shadow, can cast a shadow. If this aphorism truly works for you, it will cast a shadow over the rest of your day. This will resonate in your minds for the rest of the day as you think about the shadows that are cast by small things. Remember there was a, 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 a maxim of uh, uh, La Rochefoucauld, Goethe, and this is an important point. Aphorists write aphorisms based on other aphorisms, turning them around and rethinking them. Part of what's involved in, in reading them is getting that turn of thought. Here is Goethe turning that aphorism of, of uh, La Rochefoucauld around. Remember the one about uh, um, uh, it, it is um, less, less shameful uh, to be deceived by friends than to distrust your friends. Goethe turns it around and says, it's better to deceive oneself about one's friends than to deceive one's friends. Self-deception, even if one is betrayed, in it has a certain honor, but deception of another is, as it were, is, as it were uh, irrevocably irrevocably wrong. One of the themes of aphorisms that we find again and again in many different writers is the effort to distinguish in a single formula what the human being is. It's very interesting that there are many, many formulations for what the human being is, right? Human being is the rational animal. It's reason that distinguishes the 
human being. Human being is the animal that can play, homo ludens, right? Human being is the animal that weeps. Here's a suggestion in each of these definite, remember I said the aphorism is a kind of definition. Here's a suggestion on Goethe's part. If the apes could advance so far as to feel boredom, then they could almost become human. The human being is the animal who experiences boredom. The human being is the animal and becomes thereby human by being the animal that has a certain relationship to time, such that time can either be full or can empty itself out and leave us empty. Boredom is, as it were, of the es essence. It's not just an accident that happens occasionally. It is of the essence of what we are as human beings. That's the direction that this particular thought takes us in. And I don't, I've got another page of Goethe. I don't want to uh, miss this last one because I think this is, this is a beautiful one. One would give alms, by giving alms, giving something to a beggar, right? One would give alms more frequently if one had eyes to see what a beautiful image a receiving hand is. You know, we go by, increasingly, Michigan Avenue, there are lots of people out there, and we go by them, and we go by them, and what does it take to stop and to give someone something? If we could, if we could see, and see in such a way that we understand it, first personally, what it is, what the beauty of receiving the gift from another human being is, what a beautiful image a receiving hand is, that would be a motivation. We'll see that particular aphorism coming back by a later writer. I have a couple of more uh, by Goethe that I want to um, bring out that show us something very characteristic about Goethe. How can one come to know oneself? This aphorism is directed against that maxim that has been inherited from antiquity, which is know thyself in the sense that that maxim is interpreted. Of course, it's important to know yourself, but how? And if what we think it means is to introspectively look in and know what you are, Goethe says that is deeply mistaken. How can one know oneself? Never just by contemplating, never by looking within me, but for sure by acting. Try to do your duty and you'll know right away what substance is within you, what you really are. The proof of who you are is the realization of yourself in the world, in your actions and your interactions with others, not some sequestered interiority. Goethe was a great opponent of an introspective, and of course he was surrounded by such introspective views among many of his romantic contemporaries, a great opponent of an introspective, self-reflective, and self-contemplative vision of who we are. Who you are is what you do. Who you are is what you realize in the world. And therefore, you can see that very often aphorisms go in chains. Very often one is linked to another. And therefore, what is one's first duty? One's first duty is to do what the day demands. This is a very, very deep idea. It's the idea that the day, Monday, Tuesday, an hour at Saturday, is not just an empty slot of time, but each day poses what we might call a normative claim on us that we must respond to. Goethe's life was filled with such responsive days. The productivity of this man as a figure of government, as a scientist in many different scientific disciplines, as an artist, uh, is, is a miracle uh, to observe. The day itself, in other words, your being in time, you only have so much. That's the claim that it makes on you. This is one of those places where a superficially, extremely simple aphorism 
can prompt one really to considerable reflection. As we move to the end of the 19th and into the 20th century, the aphorism takes on what I call an experimental character. It also becomes much more individuated. It becomes something that is, I mean, these are still pretty general. It's Goethe who is speaking to us, but it's still pretty general in the sense that general, this any of us could take on. But the aphorism or notation becomes something that is increasingly individualized and tied to what we might call the adventure of thought of a particular individual. And the person who made the aphorism the very medium of his philosophical thinking was Friedrich Nietzsche. I'm not going to talk about Nietzsche's life and his work. I only have a little bit of time, but I want to, I want to highlight a couple of Nietzschean aphorisms. Let's just look at the second one. By the way, he developed in his, it really started in his uh, second, uh, uh, well, third, now that I think of it, third uh, major book, Human All to Human. He developed a certain style that carried through for most of his life, which is he takes a term, prints it in bold, puts in a dash, and then unfolds a thought about that term. So it's very much of a definitional unfolding the significance of that initial term, right? In order to move the crowd, or books. What is a book? What is a book worth? What is it that makes a book worth something? What is a book worth that doesn't carry us beyond all other books? If, and this bespeaks Nietzsche's view in, in, in such a deep way, if your action, and particularly your action as an author, does not break the confines, break through, I'm sorry, break through the confines of what has already been achieved, does not take us into some new territory, then it's not a worthy activity. That puts a big, big demand on every writer, as you can see. But that's the demand that he put upon himself. Another um, uh, aphorism by Nietzsche that I want to call your attention to here is this one. Because this is a very good example of the paradoxical formulation that can, you can get you to thinking. What does your conscience tell you? When you hear the voice of your conscience, when your conscience comes up, what is the conscience telling you? Well, you might have an answer for that, and the answer might be something like, be kind to your neighbor, or what not, or you shouldn't do that because you're not respecting so and so. Nietzsche's answer is this, that the voice of conscience is always telling you one thing, namely, become the one who you truly are. But that means that the conscience, the voice of our conscience that we hear is a voice that arises at that point where we feel a discrepancy between the life that we are living and the life that we could be living if we were really true to our ideals. Our conscience alerts us to the fact that we are not living up to what our own individual ideals are. He's not going to spell out what the ideals are, because Nietzsche has the very, very deep conviction that it's up to you and to you to decide what those ideals are. What is your ideal? It might be one thing, it might be another. But what is generally true is that you can lead a life in discrepancy from those ideals. And it's your conscience that is calling your attention to that fact. One way of expressing that discrepancy when you are not truly living up to what you are in your truest self, one way of saying that is to say that you are ashamed of yourself. You feel shame because you are not living up to what you really ought to be. What is the seal of freedom fully achieved? How do you know when you are fully free when you have achieved freedom in your life, Nietzsche asks, by no longer feeling shame in your own eyes, by no longer knowing, as your conscience is telling you, that you are not 
that you are in flight from your ideal self, we might say, that you are avoiding your ideal self, that you're avoiding that internal ideal that you yourself that is actually who you truly are. These two ideas here are extremely uh, um, closely linked to one another. And if you just cast a look up on his definition of the hero, you'll see that all of this is a piece here. Be true to yourself, even if it counts, even if it includes taking on the greatest pain. Two 20th century writers whom you may not know, but I would like to recommend to you. The first one, Elias Canetti, Romanian born. Um, grew up in England, then in Vienna. German was his third language. He won the Nobel Prize in the 1980s, I think 1984. He's the author of a novel translated into English as Auto da Fe, uh, the author of a massive anthropological study called Mass or Crowds and Power, Masse und Macht, the author of several volumes of Aufzeichnungen, notations or aphorisms, some dramas uh, as well. As you can see, like many writers, he was an obsessive uh, um, um, desk fetishist. Uh, no one ever needed this many pencils, but for some people, it's important to have them on hand. And uh, Canetti um, um, is a very, very interesting person because he takes the aphoristic form into, into regions that, that, as I say, are experimental in quite an interesting way. The first uh, one that, he, uh, that I have here by him, though, is really not such an experimental one. It's more of a general uh, truth. Uh, but it, there, it, is, it is deeply true, and I wanted to include it here because it's deeply true of what I've said. We've seen a couple of examples of where one aphorist is echoed in the work of another aphorist, and there is an internal relationship among them all. It is, he says, and he's a person who has read them closely, it is as if they all had known one another, as if they all belonged to a society of, of aphorists. Uh, this is uh, in the, he was a great fan of Chamfort, especially. This is somewhat in the moralist tradition. There's no strong wish for which one doesn't pay a price, yes. If you have a wish, a fantasy that is going to be fulfilled, it's going to cost you something. We all know that. The punchline is that the worst thing, that is to say the highest price, comes when that wish is realized. That's something that's worth thinking about. Um, one of the characteristic features of Canetti's thought is that he felt that most of the problems of society, most of the problems of human action, violence, aggression against one another, come about because the human being stands in a false relationship to death. That all of human life stands in thrall to death. And Canetti had as his project of writing the absolutely impossible but nonetheless heroically conducted project of trying to think outside of that box, which in some way is the deepest, the deepest box that we are in. He believed that the countless efforts of individuals to deflect death are the very source of the monstrous structures of power that have come into being. This is someone, of course, who, f f uh, well, Romanian, German, Jewish, Austrian, fled to England, of course, after 1933, uh, and who experienced, um, experienced the events of the 20th century with a certain degree of immediacy. So when he's speaking of monstrous structures of power here, he's speaking of the extremes to which structures of power can be formulated. And his anthropological view is that these things are rooted in our false relationship to death, that we are in thrall to death, that we have not overcome the thought of death, although it's not clear what it would mean to overcome that. A last comment here uh, by Canetti that, um, and, and that I'm going to let you, uh, there's one more person I want to show you, at least this picture, but then I'll let you, let you go. And that's uh, this one. This is where the, where the 
the aphorism goes into a kind of miniature story or anecdote. And this miniature story or anecdote is the story of an, of, of an erotic or amorous passion. They rush toward one another like mountain streams. They rejoice together like a single forest, a formulation that I find quite intriguing. They lay together and embraced with a hundred arms. What tremendous images of human erotic passion come through there. And then one of them makes a promise with a word or a statement, perhaps we might say, that he doesn't mean, it could be she doesn't mean, a single syllable, and they hate one another until death. With all of that passion, it doesn't account for anything in comparison to the wound of human betrayal, of the betrayal of one person by another. The promise offered is a false promise. I think that that's a very, very powerful example. Um, I just want to name, just so that it doesn't look like a German tour here, um, <laughs> another Romanian, however, a Romanian who went to France and had his writing career in France, Emil Sioran, uh, who is one of the great pessimistic writers uh, of all times, standing in the tradition of the moralist and standing in the tradition of, of uh, Schopenhauer, one of his masters, another aphorist. That moralist position that I talked about, right? uh, that seeing through the veneer of human pretension, that skepticism about human motivation, uh, is something that is very closely allied to pessimism about uh, human affairs. And Sioran, who was, um, was um, plagued by terrible insomnia and was a man who, 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 who never found quiet in his life, produced nonetheless a number of, of um, interesting, um, interesting aphorisms, and I've selected a couple of them. I think that the one that I'll just leave you with as we go away is here in the middle. He's often noting his own mental condition. And one of the things that can happen when you view life the way he views it is that life, th that the reality of the world empties out. It's a little bit like when you pull the plug in the bathtub and the water goes <laughs> like that. Well, that can happen with reality too. Not that the world disappears, but it takes on the quality of not really being. It empties itself out of reality. No, not the slightest trace of reality anywhere. That's what can happen to you in the middle of a, of a night of severe insomnia, for instance, or in the middle of a depression of the depressive character as well. Not the slightest trace of reality, except in my sensations of unreality. And it is there, it is there that this concept of reality that was evacuated in the first part returns in its subjective version there. This reality, un, my sensations of unreality and the reality of that sensation, I think that's a magnificent balance of those two concepts that brings to a kind of point and pinnacle, if you will, and balances on that, on that pinnacle these two, two sides. The, the, the extreme intellectual affective condition that this, that this man lived in. But he was courageous in fighting and in writing about that condition. And this one, I think, bespeaks that. The only way he can give meaning to his life is by making his life a quest for knowledge. A quest for knowledge, a search, a search for knowledge, perhaps a search also for spiritual, for spiritual release from that uh, condition. Often then combined with the experience of defeat. Have you ever had this experience, maybe about a thought that's crucial to you? Tonight, I'm sure of it, I found the definition of liberty. <laughs> As for retaining it, that's something else. Well, that's the human condition. And it is finally the human condition that in all of these views, the moralist view, the scientific view, the experimental view, that all of these aphorists are trying to get a hold of. 
this is, I spoke of philosophical reflection, but this is not philosophical reflection about the ideas. This is philosophical reflection about the status of the human being, the human being's place in the world, the human being's sufferances, the human being's obligations. That's what the aphorism is finally about. Well, I hope that that was a, a useful introduction to this poem. Thank you. Ah, yes. Yes. This is, this is remember, remember what I said before, that very often uh, we see the aphorist trying to find the nature of that borderline between human and animal. This is another case of that, right? Of course animals experience fear, but do they experience morbid fear? Do they experience fear that is fear of death? They're frightened. This is a danger. They recognize danger. But do they know that death? Do they stand in a relationship to death? Do they have a being toward death? And the idea here is, or perhaps do they have a, the, do they have a morbid fear of the murderous intentions of their fellows? That could also be what's embedded here. That's the thought of Thomas Hobbes, right? That that's what's distinctive of the human being, is that we live in fear, not just of death, but fear of murder, fear of death from the others. But here what he does is he, he derives from that state of human fear, he derives consciousness, because our consciousness is what you might call right, the way we try to cope with that. Consciousness emerges out of this anthropological situation and is then a product of morbid fear. Right? If it were just fear of all kinds, just think of the constant state of danger that most animals live in in one sort or another, they would have consciousness. But it is only that uniquely human fear directed toward death and perhaps other inflicted uh, death that makes us specifically what we are. I think, I think that memory plays, or, or, or oral memory, plays a very large role in those other forms that I'm referring to. I think that these forms are meant not to be remembered, although you can take one away, two away, you, there may be one that you'll take away here, but these are meant to be read and reread. Part of the trick is that you go back to this. You know, I've got a few books of aphorists and I ju you just go back to them. You return to them, but you return to them as book. And one of the interesting things about that is, is that you discover new things each time. That's not going to happen with a penny saved is a penny earned. As true as that may be, it's not going to happen that you're going to have a new revelation about what it, what it means. <laughs>